So, so this presentation, well, let me point out one thing real quick. I don't know how many people saw, but I posted a bro script that you can run that watches our website for changes to videos. So if we update the agenda, <laughs> it'll, let, it'll send a notice to you. And it works. I actually just ran it, and we did a little update to it, and it kicked out the notice, and <laughs> so it worked. Um, so I'm a, I'm a little terrified to do this presentation, honestly, because the topic is deeper than I realized it was going to be when I started working on this code about four years ago. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the new SumStats framework. What is some stats? It's, it's summary statistics. So we really just shortened it. Shortening it was really just sort of a way of making it so you didn't have to type so much stuff when you're writing a script. But I had gone, this has actually been through several names, and I probably point that out on a later slide, but whatever. Um, this, this is what the old metrics framework was in 2.1 and 2.0. The metrics framework wasn't real great, though. Uh, we went through a brief period where it was called the measurement framework until Vern complained to me that he didn't like the name measurement because he didn't think that it did what we normally would call measurement. And uh, he said that what it was doing was summary statistics. So I went to Wikipedia quickly and looked up what summary statistics was. And I realized I had spent the last four years implementing a mechanism for doing large scale summary statistics. So it's really just being able to say, we have a lot of observations. We need to distill those down into smaller answers. So I mean, even things like um, average is a summary statistic. You've summarized, you could summarize billions of points of data and get one number, and, and that's a summary of your many, many points of data. Uh, the motivation for doing this is clusters is the big one. I mean, when you go to a cluster, and when, when Robin and Matthias and whoever else was working on the cluster stuff originally when that was happening in 2007 or 2006, they, they worked through a lot of things to try and figure out, well, how do we do what we were doing when we had one global namespace and it was one set of memory and we didn't have to worry about processes talking to each other? What do we do to deal with that? And they had some early attempts at it, like the synchronized attribute and a few other things. It turns out that, that doing stuff on a cluster is really insanely hard. And we kept, we kept realizing that this was something that needed abstracted to be able to sort of do measurements at a really large scale across clusters. So I don't know how many people are really familiar with a cluster, but typically what you, can, you would do, say you have, you can't process all your traffic on one box. Even you know, splitting across lots of processes on the one box, so you put something on your network, like the Arista switches, or a C packet box, or Gigamon, or there's all these different vendors that sell these things that do this, but they'll do like hash-based load balancing, which will say, any time two IP addresses communicate with each other, that traffic goes to the same box. And you can do different tuples, so maybe you can include ports in there or not. Um, but just an easy, simple way of thinking about it, two hosts talk to each other, both directions of that traffic go to the same box. Because if you have the traffic going to different sides, you can't tie together request and response, things like that, for, for HTTP. Um, but the problem is, is that if you want to measure something, some attribute about what host 1.2.3.4 is doing, some of its traffic is over here, some of its traffic is over here. It's all over the place. And suddenly, you can't measure anything, because any measurement you get is going to be this itty bitty little slice on one of those hosts. So it, it was sort of this need, this recognition that, yes, this needs to happen, because we can't measure anything. It's just We just can't do it. The, the other one is having um, an interface. It's always nice, like, you go to a language and you're like, I have variables. I can store things. But isn't it also kind of nice to have stuff that does a lot of work for you? Who in this room knows how to do a streaming average? Like the, the simplest thing you can imagine, right? How do you do an average? Everyone knows how to do a grade school average. But how do you do that without storing any state? It's not that hard, but with, you, you have to know how to do it. So. Imagine, so, so if you have five numbers, it's real easy. You add them all, you divide by five, it's great. What if you have 100 billion numbers? More numbers than you can fit in memory. What do you do? It, it's why it's nice to have this interface where we can abstract this stuff and hide these implementations in it. 
And then also, this sort of leads into the next point of giving more people the ability to write these sort of analysis scripts that do these things, like calculate advanced algorithms such as average calculation. Um, it, it, it's really about you know putting hand, putting the ability in your hands to be able to do some of these things that you may not be able to do otherwise, and especially on a cluster because it's getting to the point where everyone runs cluster. I I know very few people who run standalone, or there may be like Ashish at LBNL. They have a standalone thing that is doing a very specific task, but you know generally everything is done on a cluster, which just breaks everything. So this is hopefully an abstraction that we can sort of hide all that behind. So there's, there's several points that really need to be brought out about the approach to this, because in order to do this right, the very first thing that had to happen was we had to say, here are things we can't do, <laughs> which left the very small set of things we could do. Because if we wanted to make it work on a cluster, there's all sorts of things that you just can't magically do, because the right data is not in the right place, and you can't see it. So the approach generally, though, is, uh, is right now it's discrete time slices. The statistics community, from what I understand, calls these epochs. So it's epoch-based. Um, you say, I want 15-minute epochs. And it will measure something, and then it's done. And then it sort of gets rid of all that, and it does the next 15-minute epoch. And it sort of goes on and on and on. Um, only streaming algorithms are allowed. We will not mer if you try to do the grade school averaging thing and add that as a plugin to some stats, we will not merge it. <laughs> That's not okay. The, the only streaming algorithms are allowed because um, we don't want to assume that someone doesn't have 10 billion or 100 billion or a trillion numbers that they're trying to calculate the average of. So it has to be something where there's never more than two numbers that are stored. Or, or this, the idea, there's lots of these streaming algorithms. And fortunately for us, this is actually an area that's gotten really hot in terms of research in the last five years or so. And there are lots of new streaming algorithms that are still being worked on. Every measurement also has to be mergeable. Because if you're running a cluster, you could be running 100 processes, or 50 processes, or three processes. But either way, your traffic is being spread across all of those. And once your traffic gets spread, it's back to what I was talking about. You, you can't measure anything. So you have to be able to say, I have this value, and I have this value, and I have this value, and I can merge them. So does anyone know how to take three averages and merge them together into one? It turns out, again, it's not that hard. And Bernard did the math for me one day and figured it out because I didn't feel like doing it. <laughs> but it really came down to all these little things that you don't think about. Because if you've taken this machine got 10 billion numbers and it calculated the average for those 10 billion. This machine got 10 billion numbers and calculated the average for those and this one. You don't want three numbers, you want one number. And the idea here is that SumSats hides all that. SumSats gives you one number. And you don't, have to know, you don't know that there were three numbers. You don't care that there were three numbers. One of the things that started to sort of, sort of slip into this was probabilistic data structures, because this is like the perfect use case for them. So probabilistic data structures are basically, it's a time and space trade-off, essentially. It's the, the, the traditional trade-off in computer science. You can either do something perfect, and it, it has some enormous downside, or you can you know, add some uncertainty into it, and maybe you get better CPU performance, or you get better um, memory utilization or something. So for 2.2, I believe both of these should be going in. Um, Hyperloglog, -log, which is probabilistic cardinality counting, which is how many unique things were there. So you think of like, you as sort of a silly example, uh, you want to know the unique number of URLs that every host on your network visited. To do that exact is crazy, because you have to store every single URL and say, oh, I know about that one already, so I don't have to store it. Oh, I know about that one already, so I don't have to store it. And it's kind of a toy example, but I, I think it's worthwhile, because this can be applied to anything. Um, but there is uncertainty there. It's, it's not going to be the exact value. Like The number that it gives you won't be exact. It, it'll, it'll be an estimate, but the memory savings are crazy. Because something that would have taken you know, a gig of memory to store all these URLs is 
50K or something like that. It, it's an enormous change in uh, memory utilization. And uh, probabilistic top K, which there's actually an exercise that does this, and it's really neat. We actually ran this on a live cluster and got results out of it. And we were doing things like um, it was top 10 domain names being requested over DNS, which you think about doing that exact, and it, it's sort of hard to do that exact, be just because it's going to use a lot of memory. And pro I, I don't know how it would work, but it may use a lot of CPU, too. Um, and there was another one that was top 10 names seen in the host headers, right? Um, to be able to collect this kind of information about like packet captures or about networks, it's really nice to be able to sort of summarize what data you're seeing really quickly and just say, well, I don't know, what are the, the top 10 domain names being seen? What are the, the top 10 connection initiators? What are the top 10 you know, connection responders? Like, what's the top server on my network in terms of bytes that it's, that it's sending or something? And the reason this was implemented generically is you can feed anything you want into it. Anything that's available in Bro, you can feed into it. And as Vlad showed earlier, you write your own analyzer, and then you can feed that data into it. So the real question is, why would you ever want to do any of this stuff? It's because measure it turns out to be a whole lot of fun. Like when it's something that is not horrible, horrible pain to do, it's actually tons of fun to measure stuff. I ignoring doing your job, it's just fun. I mean, you start finding out aspects of your network that you didn't know. Like you'll start finding why is this department do? You know, why is this area of my network doing so much, uh, uh, doing so many name requests to this place? Or why are there so? Why is the ratio of, you know, unique URLs to total URLs coming from this host so high? Where you know, where like there's ne they're never going to a duplicate, or perhaps they're only hitting the same URL over and over again. So you have like. Your unique is one, and your total is a million or something. There are a number of notices. That, that, so I, I use some stats like crazy already. There's a lot of, there's a, quite a few scripts in the next release that um, actually use some stats on the back end. From your perspective, you don't really care that it uses some stats on the back end, because I'm just using it as a tool to achieve a goal. So we've got like that first one up there that is the uh, detect FTP brute force or something, or like it's in the FTP directory, like policy protocols, FTP detect brute force or something. And the output, the message of the notice will actually have IP address had 349 failed logins on two FTP servers in 14 minutes, 47 seconds. That's like a lot of information, one sentence. And it just sort of pops out of bro. And with, like the code that you're running, if you load that local script, this just loads. And if someone does that, you'll get a notice. Um, a lot of people should be happy about this. I get so much flack when we came out with 2.0 from a few people that about <laughs> removing scan.bro. Because scan detection is one of the harder measurement type things that you can do because it's just so, there's a lot of state you have to track. But scan.bro is back in 2.2, and it's pretty good, I think. It's pretty short, which is a big difference from the old one. The old one was a huge mess that had sort of accumulated over time, and there was work done to make it cluster safe, and it was a lot of work, but it had kind of just gotten crusty from being around for so long. The new one, though, is very clean, nice and short. It uses some stats, which you know abstracts a lot of, it abstracts all the, the cluster support. It, um, it, it gives you enough data to come up with emails like, like, or notices like that that'll say, IP address scanned at least 29 unique hosts on port 445 TCP in one minute, four seconds. And it's actually kind of interesting, because what that will be, that time represents the time from when Bro saw and this is even on a cluster, so it'll be like, this node saw a packet that Bro said, that could be a scan. So maybe it was a connection that the other host never responded to. Like, it was like a SYN packet that was never responded to. Or it was a, um, uh, a SYN, and then they sent a reset back, or something like that. So Bro is saying, those are sort of candidates you know, for scan detection. So Bro is saying, this is one, it was, we saw one of those packets 
In the next one minute and four seconds, we saw at least 29 more, which was enough to trip the threshold and send, do this notice. So you can actually start seeing things in here, like one minute, four seconds, one minute, 13 seconds, and these are all scan. Here's one that took 37 seconds, and here's one that took one second. That one scanned really fast. It actually had different behavior than the other ones. I had been doing some playing uh, just a couple weeks ago with Scan.bro and changing the epoch. I changed the epoch to 30 minutes. It's like it's something like five or 10 minutes by default. It's pretty short. So think we don't we're not catching stuff with Scan.bro right now. That's like, as everyone says, low and slow. <laughs> that's not in there right now. But I changed the epoch recently to 30 minutes because I was playing with some stuff and actually caught one that took 17 minutes to get detected. So it had sent the packet, kept sending more over a period of 17 minutes, and then it got detected. And I looked at con log because you know the, the evidence for these scans tends to be in con log. And this machine was scanning, and it was just scanning really, really, really slow. I mean, it was like send a packet, it would wait a few minutes. It would send a packet or two to like different hosts, and then it would wait a few minutes. And it's not like that was particularly slow, but that was sort of an interesting detection because it was fairly slow. It didn't do this. This machine screamed through the network and just was sending SIN packets like crazy, just sprayed across the whole network. But you do also have ones like this. I mean, this one didn't go terribly fast. It took four minutes and four, it took a little over four minutes to get detected. And there is a little bit of uncertainty in this too, in that some stats is distributed. There's no hard point in time at which it crosses the threshold because we're not continuously pulling the data back. We're keeping it out on the workers. It is pulled back at the end of every epoch, so you can get an exact answer at the end of every epoch. But between that, it has some heuristics that says, may have crossed the threshold, let me do an intermediate check. So you will frequently detect these before the end of the epoch. Um, but at, at any rate, the times should be pretty accurate in terms of how long they took, even though it happened across a number of machines. Because it, it will actually, the, the way it merges things, it'll actually track the beginning and end of, uh, of, uh, of a measurement that it's doing, which will be per scanner. And it will track, actually, and say, you know, I, I saw the first candidate packet at this time. And if it's merging two together, it'll just do the very first, first one that it saw and not just some random time that it saw. Um, and then there's also this other one in scan.bro. So scan.bro does two different types of scan detection. It does address scan and port scan. So this one says, these ones were scanning a bunch of hosts on one port. This one scanned one host on a bunch of ports. So it says it scanned at least 15 unique ports of the host in five seconds. So something went and it just did a port scan of one host. I don't know why. And there's actually, I saw someone referring to, on, I think on Twitter, the, uh, there's even, <laughs> so I still don't know what this is going to be used for, but there's a script actually in the next release that detects trace route running. And it uses some stats to do the measurement because it helps out with cluster stuff. And there is a little bit of measurement that goes on in that. But it's, it, there's no hacking around the problem in there. It literally detects people running trace route. It watches, there's one heuristic it uses in that it watches for a kind of low TTL packet to have been sent. Because typically, you won't see these low TTL packets at all from a host. So something gets kind of put into a bucket if it sends a low TTL packet. And then the next thing it does is it actually watches for ICMP uh, destination unreachable messages. And it looks at the packet inside of that message, and it makes sure that some that host A was sending a packet to host B, and then it watches for multiple of these to come back. Anyway, it's it's exactly what traceroute does when you run it. But the log that comes out is the timestamp of when it happened. Um, it it includes the IP address that ran traceroute. It includes the IP address that the traceroute was run against. And it includes um, the protocol that they used, if they used ICMP or TCP or UDP. Um, and the, the amazing thing about that for me was that it worked. <laughs> I, I mean, there's a lot. There's a, it's surprisingly difficult to detect on a cluster trace route running. And it worked. So it was sort of cool. And it, it didn't take that long, actually, to get it to work. 
So I wanted to talk just a little bit so that maybe the present, the, when you look at the actual code, which is, I promise, will be horrifying when you look at it, so get ready for that. Um, I wanted to, to show a little bit about how, how things are constructed in, uh, in the SunStats framework. So you have observations that feed into reducers that feed into a SunStat. So just keep that in mind. So observations, observations are super simple. It's, it's a single point of data. It's, you know, I observe something. I observe the DNS lookup. I observe the DNS, an HTTP request. I observe an ICMP message. And, and, and that can be even, even more uh, granular than that because it could be, I saw a host header. I saw a, I saw a, <laughs> I don't know. I, I saw a Windows executable. There, sort of, it just goes on and on. It's sort of any little bit of data, like something that you could be like, ah, that, that, that ah is the observation. Looks like I wanted to have a third sub point, but I don't remember what it was. So <laughs> observations feed into reducers. Reducers are, are basically what's doing the calculations, the average calculation, or the top K, or whatever else. Um, you feed lots and lots and lots of observations into a reducer, and a reducer summarizes those down into, let's just say, the average. So you feed um, the, the size of connections into a reducer, and then the reducer takes the average. So say you want to get the average, the average size of data sent for each local host or something. You would feed that into a reducer, and a reducer would calculate the average. So, or sum of content length headers, that was the example I had, or a unique number of DNS requests. The SumSat then collates multiple reducers. So you can actually have, you can measure multiple things and the SumStats framework will collate them for you and then you can do comparisons. Like, uh, you could, okay, the, the example I have here was ratio of unique DNS requests and unique hosts, host names seen in HTTP traffic. So you can actually compare, so say you, you're like interested in all your local hosts and you wanna like measure some sort of ratio that, uh, of something that they're doing. That's something you can actually do, and it's very easy with this code. Um, and then you handle the result. This is where you handle the results from redu reducers and do something. That could be th setting thresholds. It could be um, uh, just writing a log. It could be doing all sorts of stuff. So I'm just about done with the presentation. I just wanted to show this again. So you have the observations where you see something. You feed them into a reducer where you actually do a sum or an average or the top K or hyperloglog log to know how many unique things happen probabilistically. And then you feed them into a sum stat where you can actually do things with the reducers and do things with the results at the end of the epoch or set thresholds and stuff. So there is an exercise that is posted on the, uh, um, If I could find my mouse. Hey. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I see that. And so on the agenda page, if you go there, there is an exercise posted for this one. Well, actually, I guess before I really go into the exercise, are, does anyone have any questions about this? I, I really have kind of a hard time presenting it because it's dense. I mean, there, it's, it's extremely dense to try and present this. And when you see the code, it's going to be even worse. Oh, that's not good. In a minute, it, has anyone gotten to the exercise, actually? Well, that's a good start, if now only I could get to it. So does anyone have any questions? Because I can tell you, if any of you write scripts. There's a hard wire up there. Oh, that would be. Oh, actually, I don't have my adapter. Oh, OK. Sorry, right. oh, I'll have it one second. So I, so I will say that. Um, 
anyone writing, anyone that writes bro scripts is almost certainly going to want, is only almost certainly going to use some stats to do detections because it, it, makes, it makes a lot of stuff much, much, much easier. Hey, look at that, he made it. So there should be on that, um, that USB thumb drive thing from Arista a file called exercise traffic.pcap. It's like an 80 meg thing. I need slightly larger uh, traffic samples for this because I'm actually measuring things. It's not, I'm not looking at a single connection. I'm looking at many connections. It, this is when it's going to get really hard. This, this sort of stuff is when it's going to get very hard with Bro to do a very cut down examples because the point is that you're measuring cross flow. So I mean, th this is like the epitome of cross flow work, basically. So I, I think that this stuff is complicated enough that I'm going to go ahead and just walk through the exercise, but you can do it with, along with me. Um, laser. So if anyone's familiar with Bro programming, you're going to see the events like this. This is an, a DNS request happen. I actually went ahead and limited this to say I only care if the respond report is 53 UDP and the query exists. I, for some reason in this trace file, I've seen ones that the query came up empty, and I never looked into that. But they're filtered out with this. So what you'll see, though, is what it's going to do every time is uh, call, do this observe call. And this is an arbitrary name, dns.lookup. It's just a text string. It doesn't matter. It just You need to know what it is so you can use it again later. Now, this first thing is the key. It's literally the key, not the, the key to life or anything. Um, so this, when you're measuring and you're setting thresholds or something, you're probably going to want to know the uh, whatever we're doing with this um, unique. You're going to want to know like the unique number of lookups for every host on your network or something, or for every host in your trace file, not just like the unique lookup seen in the traffic because that doesn't really you can't do much with that. You can log it and it's interesting to know maybe, but you can't really do much with it in the sense that. You're like, well, great, but who did so many unique lookups? This actually gives you the ability to say, ah, well, it was that host that did it. And then as the value, the actual observation, it's this third field, and it is, it's a record, but the field name is string, and we just give it the query. So that's where, you, that's where you'll start a lot of times, and it's just incredibly simple. You say, what's the one point thing I'm measuring? And we're just saying, it's the query. Now, what are you going to do with it? That's you're, well. Sorry, you're saying the query for by querier, which is the origin host. But then, what are we going to do with it? Is where it gets more interesting. So this is on my slide. It's that top part with the lots and lots of observations. So what do we do first? We feed. So we had DNS dot lookup here, and now we say the observation stream that we're hanging this off of is DNS dot lookup. And what we're going to apply to it, we could, well, there's a set, so you can actually apply multiple calculations. But we're actually going to apply the unique measurement to it. So we want to know the unique number of queries. And it's tracked per, uh, per key. So then the next part is that you need to feed your reducer into a sum stat. So you, there's a sum stats create call. And this is where most of the work ends up going. So you'll see, you just have to give it a name. It's, again, arbitrary. There's an unfortunate reason why that's there, but just know that you have to give it a name. The epoch that I'm defining here for this trace file is six hours. So we're saying the number of unique DNS lookups in six hours, or per six hours. And then the reducer is this R1 value that we put up here. And it's a set because you can actually have multiple reducers. So if you want to compare things between uh, diff totally disparate measurements. Um, and then we come down into epic result. So epic result is saying, six hours is over. Here's the result. So what you actually get is a timestamp time for, for when it ended, because 
network time, it's a little fuzzy as to, to what time is. So we actually include a time directly there. Um, the key, and the key is this. So you'll actually get that record. And then a result, which the result has sort of your, your unique data in it, or it has your top K data in it. It has your stuff in it that you wanted. So you come back over here, and your result, you, um, you grab your result. And you have to the first thing you have to do is define which reducer you're talking about, because it actually gives you access to all the reducers you attach. So we pull out the DNS.lookup one, because we only have one reducer. So you have R. And then we print out this, this string that says, whoever did however many total and however many unique DNS requests in the last six hours. And then just to make it look nice, there's actually this other, um, there's this other callback here that is called epic finished. And it's saying, I'm done calling epic result. Because it's going to call epic result for every key that it has. So it's going to call it, call it, call it, call it. And then when it's done calling them and it has no more data, it calls epic finished. So we just print out this line with some dashes just to make it look nice. So that's it. I mean, it's a little complicated, but this, is, I think, is just about as close to as simple as we could get it. But the real thing is that this enables someone on a small network, actually, because we've abstracted all the cluster handling. Someone on a small network can write one of these scripts, and someone on a big network that has a huge cluster could run it, which is different. It used to be that people on small networks could not write scripts that people on big networks could run. But this is getting a little closer to, to that not being true anymore. So we go down, and if you run it, you just have to you know, bro-r, dash some stats dash one, if that's what you named it. And what actually comes out is sort of what you'd expect. 192.168.1.21 did 17 total and six unique DNS requests in the last six hours. But this is the kind of data that I don't think a lot of other tools could give you the ability to sit down for 10 minutes and write a script that could give you this data out of a trace file, for instance, if you're just maybe parsing through some trace files. And maybe if you're looking for something like high volumes of DNS, high volumes of unique DNS compared to total requests and things like that. Oh, and I guess I for one thing I forgot to point out up here is so to fill out the fields in that format statement that is what it actually prints out, key dollar host. And if you scroll back up to the observation, it's that. That's key is this, and so dollar host, it gives you that value. And then Result dollar num is always available. It's how many observations were fed in. And then r dollar unique is the number of unique values. And this is exact. This actually could potentially have memory problems because this is an exact number, which if it was 10 billion unique things, it's going to have memory problems. But this is where we're, we're going to get hyperlog log worked in. And there will be better ways of dealing with that that, that you know you could deal with it essentially by just changing this to HLL unique or something, and, and you've dealt with it. You don't have to care that it's wildly different internally. So you get that. It's pretty straightforward. But what if you want to do more? You're not going to do a detection that way, probably. You may do a detection, though, with thresholds. So again, it's, we're just basing this off of the same ob observation. So that, uh, that observe call. Same thing. We're not changing that at all. All we're changing is that we're creating a different sum stat. So we create a reducer that is, OK, we didn't change the reducer either. So it's the same reducer, too. We're saying DNS lookup, and it's applying the unique uh, calculation. So now we're going to name this one. doesn't matter, but we're going to name it DNS.thresholding. We set the epic at six hours again. We, take the, we add this reducer into the sum stat. And then we have this callback called threshold val that says, here's a key, here's a result. What's, what's your threshold value? So there's two parts of thresholding. There's the value you're checking against. So my threshold is 100. But then the other part is, here's some data. What part of it do you want to get to to have a number that you compare against 100? Which is, which, is what, um, which is what this provides. So here, what it's actually doing is all I'm saying is I want to take the dns.lookup reducer and take the unique value out of it. 
and then actually cast it to a double <laughs> and return that. And so it's basically just taking the unique value of that reducer defined right there and returning it, which the threshold val is essentially the number of unique things. But you can imagine that you could take other things out of this result. Like say you're not calculating unique, you could be calculating the average. And so you could actually set a threshold on the average by returning average here instead of unique. And we're going to set the threshold at 150. So this is where you're actually setting the threshold. And you're saying, my threshold's 150. And then there's a callback so that when the threshold gets hit, it actually calls a callback. And again, you get pretty similar looking stuff. You get the key, and you get the result. So we come in, and we say, some host did more than 150 unique requests. And if this was a real script, it probably wouldn't have the 150 in there. And then you just take key dollar host. So then if you run that again, you come down and it says 192.168.1.301 did more than 150 unique requests. And 105 and 102 did more than 150 unique requests too. There's more information you could put there. You could say how long it took them to do, to do the unique requests. You could sample and actually get a sample of the requests that they did. We, um, Bernard actually did real sampling instead of my hacky, not real statistical sampling. We actually do reservoir sampling that, uh, that is a statistical method for getting an actual sample of you know, observations sent in. So that's, to get a sample is just another thing up here. You say, I'd like to take a sample of the observations. And you can say, like, I want 10 samples or something. So again, that is a big complicated wall of text, but once you understand how these all tie together and how this works, there's a lot of stuff you can start implementing on top of it to say, I want to detect this thing, and I want to watch for this, and I want to do this. And I suspect over time, we're going to expand some stats to make it do more things and work slightly differently, too. So. The one other one other one on this DNS one that I wanted to show, yeah. So sorry, can, can you go back to the first example really quick? Uh, the the solution for it. So Epoch finished is printing out that little delimiter. Why is uh, the delimiter at the top as well? It's due to event scheduling in Bro, okay. probably. I pro I'll look at that. I, yeah, it, I'm sure it's probably something to do with event scheduling. I'm not totally clear. Okay, I, I just wasn't sure if yeah, I... Yeah, I did a lot of work on some stats last week, and I probably broke that last week, so I'll look at it. So what I wanted to show was one additional little thing real quick, which is um, doing ratios as values. I'm sorry, setting thresholds on ratios. So again, it's the same thing, but now we call it dns.distinct.thresholding. So we're looking to say, like, what's the, what's the ratio of distinct to non-distinct DNS requests being done by a host? So this is where threshold val gets a little more complicated for us, because suddenly we're saying the threshold val, we, really, we only want to even do the thresholding if the, the number of observations is greater than 50. Because less than 50, you start doing percentages, and it's just hard to, to map that out. And we return the unique number divided by the total number. So it's the unique number of DNS requests divided by the total number. So what you're actually getting is a ratio of the distinct requests. So we set the threshold at 95%. So we're saying that I want something, oh, I thought I had to think through this this morning. This is, I want something that is 95% distinct request, where there's not a lot of, am I saying that backwards? That's saying, not, oh, actually, I have it, I guess, in the, uh, in the print statement down here. Some percent or more of the total number of DNS requests by, made by a host are distinct. So what I'm sa saying is, is that I want, I, want to I want to know when something is making 95%. It's, it's done more than 50 requests, 
and 95% or more of those are distinct, so they're, they're not unique. So if, it, like say for instance, you had, you only requested the same name over and over and over and over again, you're gonna have one, you're gonna have like 100 requests and one unique. So you're gonna have, I guess in that case, 1% would be your value. But this one is saying, out of 100, 95 of them were, were new ones that were, not, that were not repeats of previous ones. And this works on clusters. This is, this is where it gets like insanely complicated. If you did this in your own script and you wrote a script to do it, it wouldn't be that bad until you tried to make it work on a cluster, and then it would be a mess. So we get in, and it's again the threshold cross. We grab the same reducer, and then we just sort of output the, the percent, and we output the total number for, so we can say the percent or more of the however many DNS requests made by key dollar host are distinct. And then if you run that, you actually come out with one host that says 95% or more of the 75 DNS requests during one of these six hour epochs made by that host are distinct. And again, we could add the time into there so we could say in this time period, you know, four hours and three minutes or something like that. So are there any questions about any of this? I'm sure it's horribly dense. But let me say one thing. This stuff is making it so, at the very least, we can write scripts that are much cooler. So it, it, that we push back into Bro and stuff, so everyone gets to run them. So this is getting into the top K stuff. So we have top K support at a low level in Bro. Who's over it? Is it 3.30? 3.30? So this is saying um, we want to do top K, but we, we put top K in, Bernard put top K in at a low level. So there are primitive support, so we could add top K to other things, or you could do it without some stats. But then Bernardo was also kind enough to go ahead and do a, do a plug-in for the some stats framework, so it actually wraps it up and makes it nice to use here. So the code is gonna look really similar for this too, and I actually went ahead and put the, uh, the DNS request, so it's, it's literally the same code from earlier. So we're still doing the same observation, but measuring it differently. So for every requester, we're measuring the query as an observation. So the reducer in this case is a little bit different, because the reducer is saying, I want to do top K, and I, I'm not doing the unique one anymore. And I'm setting the top K size at 50. And you have to consider that because it's probabilistic, this, this is where it gets horrible to explain, and feel free to ask Bernard later if you want a better explanation. Because it's probabilistic, it's better to greatly oversize the number it's tracking in its internal data structures so that you can just take sort of the cream off the top of it at the end, because your results are gonna be better. The, the bigger your test set is, or I don't know what to call that, the, the bigger your, your measurement set is, or what it's, it's trying to store, I guess, the bigger that is, the better chance you have of getting uh, better results at the end. So we actually go ahead and say 50, which may not be big enough, I don't know. But this is sort of a toy anyway. So again, an arbitrary name. We are using an epic of 12 hours here. We feed the sum stats reducer into the reducer set, and again, it's the same kind of code. This is just the epic result. So we're saying, okay, well, 12 hours is done, now what's the result? I don't care that this was complicated to do on clusters, or I don't care that doing probabilistic top K is sort of complicated all by itself. I would just like to know the result. So we go ahead and do the thing that is pretty common by now, result, and you grab out the, um, the, the reducer. So you pull out the, reduce, the single result for the reducer into, into R. And due to some stuff of how some stats work, you have to, <laughs> this would be nice if this could look a little nicer. Anyway, you have to create a vector, and there's this lower level built-in function called top k get top k, and you have to feed this into it. But it's a pretty common thing. If you're doing top k, you just sort of do this, and it works. 
And then we say get 10 out, and Bernard tried to explain to me yesterday why this doesn't actually get 10, but it doesn't get 10. There's a reason for it, and I feel very confident that it's a good reason. But it's very possible that you could say get 10 element, get the top 10 elements, and it'll give you 15 or 16 or 20. Anyway, so then we output a string that says top 10 DNS requests by whoever for some period through some period or some time through some time. And then we just iterate through all of these top k, and they're going to be sorted. So the first one you hit is going to be the, the top one. And we're actually doing this because when we get to the 10th one, we want to stop because it could have more than 10, even though I told it just to give me 10. But it's right to do it that way, apparently. Um, so the name, this is, this is a little complicated because the top, you have to know how the top K stuff works, but there is an example up now. This is up on the internet. So you're basically going and you're getting the, the top val, the top request name, and then you have an estimated count of how many times that one was requested. And then it iterates through all those and prints them out, top, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then it prints a blank line just to make it nicer to read. And then you actually see the, the observation down here. And again, it's super easy to run, you just run it like that. And then the output actually is something, again, that th this is something that is sort of interesting, but would be probably pretty hard to get from just about any tool. And the script took me, um, well, I just copied the previous ones and modified it a little bit, so like two or three minutes to write this one. And I got this output. And this is, I mean, I except for like the output of it, I'd have to have it log somehow differently or something. This is something that you could run in production. Like you could do this at 10 gigabits per second, and it was a two minute script, and it would actually work when the release comes out and I fix it on cluster, sorry. And it will work, I promise. Um, so this is something that, I mean, how many people know, could even collect this off their network from their DNS server, collect it out of their logs? I mean, you could certainly do it in after the fact analysis in, in a database or something like that, or, or by writing scripts that sort of go through everything and output stuff, but this is, done in real time. And it's actually something that, you know, if anyone wants to run this script, you can just run this script on trace files and find this data out for yourself. And it's, it's very easy. And make it that short. Well, what will actually happen is you will It'll, it'll, you'll keep getting these. So right. for every 20 minutes, it'll be like, done. And then it'll, it'll clear, start over. Yeah, you could just clear it and just have it just continuously. Yeah, and that's how, that's how it works, actually. So yeah, if you ran it on a trace file that was like a terabyte, and you did epics of um, 30 minutes or something, it's just going to do, I measured that 30 minutes. I measured that 30 minutes. I measured that 30 minutes. And it's just going to keep going on. Um, yeah. But it's interesting. It's almost no work. And there, it does bubble things to the top, and you see it. But maybe on your network, you're not, maybe you have 100,000 hosts that are actively speaking, doing DNS requests, and this would suck. I mean, this would be terrible. Like, it just the, it, every 30 minutes or six hours or whatever, it's just going to barf on your screen. And that's not worth it. But maybe you do still want to know maybe the, the top requests. So this one is actually a small modification on the previous one to say, we're interested in just the top 10 DNS requests. And you could split this. There's other stuff you could do. Like you could split into inbound requests, outbound requests. Inbound, you could, I mean, if you run an authoritative server on your network, you could say, Inbound authoritative, inbound recursive requests, outbound recursive requests, outbound authoritative requests. You could really do all of this stuff and split it up however you want by changing your keys. So right now, we're just using the host as the key. But in here, if you wanted to, so here we're actually using no key. So that's just going to say there's only going to be one of these measurements done. It's not going to measure once per host on your network or anything like that. 
it's just going to put it all into one top k thing, and that's it. But say you had you came up with a string that was like, uh, let's see, outbound authoritative, outbound recursive. That could be your key. And so maybe you could have four: outbound recursive, outbound authoritative, inbound authoritative, inbound recursive. And you could split it like that and use those as your four keys. And so it would actually track that four times. But then you come in here, it's the same thing again. It's top K, top K size 50. Uh, it's, it's hooking off of the DNS lookups, which is the name down here. So it's saying, I want to use those observations. And then it's tying that reducer into there and setting an epic of 12 hours. And the interesting part is epic results. So at the end of 12 hours, you get to find out how many, um, how many, what, or what the top 10 DNS requests on your network were. And it's very similar code. It's actually the exact same. I'm just not printing an IP address here. That's the only thing I changed. I just don't print an IP address there anymore. Because previously it said top 10 DNS requests by IP address for you know this time period. And that's the only difference. So you come down to when you run it, and you get that. That's kind of cool. I mean, the fact that you can do that, this is actually, when I started at GE, sort of similar to something Richard had asked me for in like, the first day. He was like, summarize. A, I, want, I have a trace file, and I want to summarize it. <laughs> and this is one step that direction, because it was sort of an open-ended question. But you don't, just because all these were done with DNS requests, how many events could you hang off of? What if you wanted to measure? Um, as, a, as kind of a silly example, maybe um, year like the <sighs> this is really weird. You could measure the the average of all the times that you see Windows executables compiled. You take the timestamps out and you average them. It, it's completely stupid because you're just sort of averaging dates. Like, well, this was March third and this was March eighth or March, March 8th to March 3rd, so we're going to be like March 5th is the average. But that's something you could actually do with this and the uh, PE analyzer. Like, there's nothing to stop you from doing that. And you could certainly output that data or set thresholds on it. I, I, there's, it, it just gets bizarre when you start thinking about it. Or you take Scott's work and you start measuring that stuff. Who's lo who is uh, logged in on the, the most... The, like unique hosts that usernames are logged into or something. Like you could measure, you could set thresholds on. If some, if some user logs into this number of hosts simultaneously or something like that, I don't know. It's coming up with stuff off the top of my head. But it's the idea that when you have events, the events get the data in and then this measures. It doesn't matter where the data came from or what the data is. Yeah? So um, the uh, methods? Yeah, uh, you could. You could yeah, you could do the, the top 10 methods or something like that. Or, or you could set thresholds on ratios of, of various request types. It, the, the hard part about this is it, it's blowing such a wide door open that I, I, don't, I don't know what all I want to write yet. I mean, I've written a few things. There's a script in Bro22 called, um, called AppStats that actually looks at, at network traffic and it looks at SSL and HTTP, and it takes the server name indicator from SSL and the host header from HTTP, and it does some manipulations on it, and it, it measures application usage. And an app application might be Google or Netflix or uh, Facebook. And I think there are problems with it currently, and who knows? We may ship with the problems. Maybe someone can fix it for me. But the idea is it was Justin Azoff that had written this script originally, and I ported it and sort of modified the uh, SumStats framework until this worked. But it, it actually gives you the ability to say, like, we've seen four unique IP addresses watching Netflix movies. Those IP addresses have transferred, have downloaded a total of 10 gigs of data. So it actually measures unique number of IP addresses, number of hits, which is like number of times an IP address was seen hitting one of these apps. And um, 
and the number of bytes that were downloaded. Because he was trying to do performance monitoring of their network. And one thing they ran into was someone, I, I forget what, who exactly it was, but it was someone that was balancing stuff, or, or I, I guess load balancing is the correct term, load balancing across Akamai. And he would see all this traffic, and he said, 40% of our traffic is Akamai. He's like, what the hell? Like, it goes to their address space. So he said, OK, we're, and some of it's SSL. So he said, OK, what we're going to do is use SSL and HTTP to actually go deeper into the application and measure based on the host name of what's, of what's used. So if someone goes to blah, 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 dot Microsoft.com or something, this cuts out the beginning and turns it into Microsoft.com or, or Google.com or whatever and says that's Google usage. And, um, and there are some, it, uh, it is limited in a few other ways to try and reduce that to really get people like using Google to like search or something like that. But it uses this and ultimately what it outputs is it's fascinating to look through and, and Justin at some point had um, graphs where he could actually see the number of people using Netflix during the day. And, and you know, overlaid on that was like the number of bytes of data they're transferring. It's fun. I, I will say definitely that one slide doesn't even begin to represent how fun this is and, and how much this really changes what you can see on your network. And the, I think another big thing to really that I really want to kind of hit on, this was designed. This was not designed as a toy. It was not designed to give a demo. It was designed to run long term on huge networks. So any of the things that are showing here are not demos pulled together to show them. They're meant to, I mean, we run a lot of things like this run on these networks that are doing 10 gigabits per second or 12 gigabits per second, and they work when I don't break it. But I'll fix that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I hope this at least was a taste. You can go back to this stuff. There are scripts. Feel free to ask on the mailing list if you want me to point to all the scripts that use SunStats, or you can search for SunStats through the scripts, the policy directory. Um, it's a, it's th this, this is going to take a long time to figure out what we can measure with it. And I'm really looking forward to see, seeing what people measure with it. And I hope people share scripts, because they're very short and they work well. So I am a little bit early, but I think that's it. Are there any questions? Because I hope there are questions. Yeah, Vlad. Are there any other, other reducers yet, apart from average, sum, hyper log log, and top k? Did I seriously not put all the reducers in my presentation? I didn't, did I? I didn't. Um, oh, that's backwards. Interesting. Um, there, there are, right now there is, there's average, there's max, there's min, there is um, top K, there, is, there, there will be um, hyper log log, there is unique, wait, wait, sorry? Oh, yeah, there's a standard deviation and variance. There is, um, I think that's about it right now. The, the oh, sum, <laughs> that one's not too hard. You just add numbers together. Um, I think that's it right now. Sample, or that was that was the other one I missed, where it's actually doing the reservoir sampling, and it's it's nice. I, I think I actually use that in the um, SQL injection detection script. The idea is that if you detect someone doing like a bunch of SQL injection looking requests, just when you if you send the analyst an email, send them some samples of the SQL injection requests because. Why would you want to have to go further than your inbox to see if a machine is actually like vulnerable? So that's the idea here: is that you you literally you look in your email and you go, 
yep, that's a problem, and then you go deal with it. Like, why would you want to go further? Um, yeah, so that's it. Sample was the other one I was missing. Um, oh, and yeah, you said last, too. I forgot there's last, which if you do last, you could have it say, like, the last 10 samples, or sorry, the last 10 observations were, so you could actually, sampling is just a mix of all the observations you saw, and last is like the last ones you saw. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of things. This isn't, there, there's more stuff in there in terms of uh, calculations than just uh, act straight summary statistics, because some of those aren't, but they're helpful to have along as companions with the actual summary statistics. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, there's no reason you couldn't have a top K and then feed that into another, into an ad, have the output of that as an observation. You could certainly do that. So it basically, in your uh, epic finish, or sorry, your epic result callback, you would just call some stats observe with your with your result. Hadn't thought of that yet, but yeah, that should work. Maybe. I actually need to, we might need to write a test to make sure that works, because it might not. Um, anything else? Sorry about that. <laughs> the, some stats is a little dense, so anyway, that's it. <laughs>